It's play at Woodbine and so much more. All stakes pick five is what we'll discuss today. All part of a 13 race program on Sunday in Canada and joining me. Not sure we did any Woodbine last year, but uh, to much fanfare, we did the Indiana Derby card. Some success stories. Hopefully more to come on the Kings Play card. Optics EQ, Hawthorne, Emily Gullickson. Thanks for joining us. I do a little Woodbine too. This you might do. be a yes. familiar place That's for the me. Whole point of you being the first person I ask, knowing that like me, we we spread the love. We're not one track or one circuit people. Oh yeah, yeah. And Woodbine's a tough circuit. I mean, with this with the stakes races, you get to see some familiar faces and trainers and some of those horses that you can go back and watch replays. But on the 13 race card, there's a lot of locals in there following the circuit, following the form. There could be some weather. Um, as we talk about some of these races, it'll change a little bit as horses are cross-centered. Um, but yeah, following the circuit, Woodbine is, uh, it's tough. It's a long meet, goes from April all the way through the middle of December. A lot of races, a lot of horses in races. That always makes things tricky as well. Now, uh, obviously follow you, certainly follow some of the people who are up there anyway, uh, occasionally catch the signal between uh, other races. And it seems Woodbine... I don't hear as much there as it seems other places, Saratoga especially, which for whatever reason, the handicappers there love to talk about track biases and stuff. Not that they don't exist, but it seems like it's a lot at Saratoga. I don't get that as much at Woodbine. Now they do have the synthetic. Is that part of it? Or is it just a, for whatever reason, I'm not hearing it. I know you watch a lot of races. You do the notes, you do the replays. Uh, is it as fair as... I think it is. It really is. I mean, certain days, certain profiles, the wind can impact it, the weather, those things come into play more than the actual surface itself. But I think the Tapita plays pretty fair. Um, it's always, you know, like any day you should watch on the race day to follow trends. If anything seems to, to be out of the ordinary or even trends just in terms of barns or jockeys that, that are kind of finding their fire on the right day. Um, I, I think bias in general is a little bit overstated. Um, I heard that a lot just with the conversation with Del Mar in the opening week. Everyone, oh, the inside, I think they were saying the inside was dead and following it. I, I thought it, I thought it played fair. I think if you are one of those people that's calling out a bias, then you should be really looking at those horses that you're playing next out, right? If there's a real true bias, because there's horses that, that had that excuse. And I, I think that that part of the bias is um, fewer and far between. Uh, well, that's uh, good to know because that means uh, less for me to go back to in the charts for some of these races to to try to sniff that out. Uh, two turf sprints, two-year-old stakes, a route on turf, which I believe is one turn at Woodbine mm -hmm. anyway, so uh, we, we won't be going around two there on the grass. A dirt sprint, and then, of course, the King's Plate uh, caps the pick five. It does start with one of those. Two-year-old races, uh, the catch a glimpse, this of the Philly variety. And uh, when I think of Woodbine in particular, because I do play King's Plate Day and Woodbine Mile Day, uh, and they have those big two-year-old races, these are some of the races I think of. Uh, you know, you get some shippers in from New York, obviously some locals like you mentioned. And uh, I thought both division, well, not divisions, but both of the two-year-old stakes were pretty competitive. Uh, no, no gimmies in this opening leg. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the toughest part of these two-year-old stakes is Mark Cassie has some of the runners that are cross-entered. So mm. it's tough to know. And so, someone like me who does, who is less doing horse picks and more handicapping the race as an entirety, that certain scratches impact the race shape where you could have, a faster paced scenario, a softer paced scenario sure. that, that changes things around. Um, so starting off in race six in the catch and glimpse stakes, number five, ready to jam is one of those horses that's also entered in, um, in race eight, the other stakes race. And I think she has a look in, in either spot. I would imagine they'd run here, but you never know. I'd give her a look in, in either race going back to her debut. That was back on July 1st. That was a better than look race. 
um, showed a lot of run and validated that breaking your maiden on July 23rd. And that's at today's distance. And six and a half can be tricky. It's an extended sprint distance. You have to have speed. You have to have stamina. You have to have class for that type of distance. Same thing with seven. So the fact that she's already proven that, again, I'd give her a look in, in either spot. But I would imagine that they run here. Tough to say. Uh, any, the, I think it's the morning line favorite seven to two dancing Duchess on the outside number 11. Uh, I guess I get why the favorite certainly with the connections, uh, runner up finish last time maiden win. I mean, gate to wire going five furlongs, I guess what you would expect, uh, from a well-meant two-year-old, although didn't take money that day that this feels like one of those can win. I'm not. The short price, though, I mean, to me, especially starting a pick five, this horse is one of the ones taking money. She just doesn't doesn't seem worth as the favorite. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can see why. I mean, number wise, she's run kind of progressive numbers, run some of those faster races. So from a speed figure standpoint, that's probably part of the reason. I'm trying to see if she's entered in. She's also entered in race eight. Okay. Um, so I could see that. And as far as her debut, that's at four and a half furlongs. That was a better than look race as well. She was still a little bit green, had the outside post. It was an open length pace setting winner. Obviously took money that day and made a positive physical impression when she rushed up again, off a little bit slow, but was able to make the lead in, on June 17th. Um, the My Dear Stakes, that was a day that there was weather conditions. It started raining before the race, continued to rain during the race. And that's something with the tapita that you don't see because it doesn't say like sealed or sloppy or muddy or anything. But it was it was legitimately raining that day. Um, and she ran fine. It got a little bit of a shuffle in traffic and then closed ground. It's just a different it's a different ball game going on the turf and going a little bit longer than she's ever gone. So when you're looking at that type of thing, as far as po poking knocks in the favorite, that's certainly it, as well as being an outside post. Uh, also on the outside, I wanted to ask you about Rosa because uh, the number, at least I'm, I'm bristling at and I haven't looked at other numbers yet, uh, was fine, not as fast as others, but, and granted we did say the track plays fair, fairly, but five and a half for two-year-olds, when I see a horse able to make a move like that, um, and actually pass horses like that strikes my eye. Usually I feel like two year olds when they're ready to run going to be a little more forwardly placed. So that kind of stuck out to me as potentially more impressive than the number indicated. Um, and was curious if, if you uh, agreed or maybe your number says, yeah, hey, actually it was faster anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, the, no, the number is what it is. We have it as a 78, which it's, it's a first start. It's going five for a long. She had trouble at the start, made that move <clears throat> and did so into a, there was some pace to run at that day, but the optics grade is a B plus, which says what that indicates is a B is a standard kind of winning type effort for the level. So when a horse does a B plus, they're showing that uh, they're dominant in that race and can probably take the step up in class, which she's going to be tested to do in here. So I have, you know, I have no knocks on her and, and could even see her a little bit closer to the pace, noting that she did have some trouble at the start. And just for, uh, the understanding the metric, what would uh, lower than B mean? Just it set up for them or got lucky? Uh, yeah, if you're if you're winning with a grade that's below below a B, it's probably a weaker race for the level. Probably had a setup, maybe a scenario where another horse won and was a disqualification, and that horse earned uh, a B minus kind of by default. But typically, right. it's a B is a pretty standard winning grade for the level. All right. Uh, any anything else in here we didn't uh, touch on? Um, let me just kind of go over it again. This race is this race is tough. Right. Um, I, I guess Sugar Treat would kind of be one that's maybe worth a mention just because it's kind of a bit of a wild card as uh, she broke her maiden at Gulfstream Park. Now, Gulfstream Park in June is not the, the championship meet, so a little bit softer company, but at least they thought enough of her to run in a Skylar Villa grade three. That was on opening day at Saratoga, um, a race that was won by a very well met Gary Contessa, first-time starter, who didn't really do much in her, in her second start, uh, came up short. As far as Sugar Treat, there was really no excuse for her in that race. She kind of stopped wide, but um, at least showing some confidence that they're going to reset, come to this point and come to Stakes Company, has to improve number-wise is, is one of the softer ones, but um, another one that maybe still hasn't moved forward. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how much Mark uh, or the barn, whoever was with her elsewhere, thinks turf, because uh, I know at Gulfstream that's not going to be an option for a while, so they get right. that Woodbine. She is Florida bred, so, I mean, there's some good money opportunities had they stayed in, in Florida. So, you know, some mixed signals, but they paid a boatload for a $5,000 stallion, so. And she has been working on the turf since that race. All three of her works at Saratoga since have been all on the turf. All right, that's uh, race six to catch a glimpse, uh, which will have some familiar names upcoming in race eight. Before that, though, is uh, the lone Tapita Sprint stake in the sequence. The Bold Venture, it's a grade three. And another situation, uh, they got a good group here. What is it? Ten all told entered. Uh, I understand why the, the horses they have is the ones expected to take money, numbers one and nine in particular, as the shortest favorites. But I, I don't, yeah, definitely fine. don't see either as a standout. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, Candy Overload has some of the stronger figures coming in, has been competitive in Graded Stakes Company, but it's a closer, a closer at a short price that's going to have to get a lot in their favor in order to win, has come up short without excuses in the past. I mean, the Pink Lloyd Stakes was, was a pretty competitive race, ran fine, that was a B, but again, this is a little bit tougher company. And again, it's just more in terms of value and trip, anytime closer at a short price, that's just one of those things you, you need to be much the best in, in that type of race. Um, old chestnut, kind of the same thing. I mean, has some versatility, but another horse that he's been consistent, but hasn't really shown that winning type race at this level to take a short price. And I think the one that you missed on the morning line is the five who's three to one, the second choice and could yes. be favored and perhaps has a pace advantage just based on the complexion of this race, but he's had favorable setups against softer. So maybe has that pace advantage in here, but he's going to have to run much better than he's run in the past with those favorable trips and smaller fields at a little bit more ground. Um, so I, you know, I agree with you. I think those horses all have knocks, especially at a short price. And then you kind of go through everybody else and they kind of just are who they are. So I, I'm looking at number two flag of honor mm -hmm. just as a complete new phase. I know what everybody else can bring. I don't know what this horse can bring, but there seems like there's some intent as they're going to pick this spot for the first start. Maybe he's here because he can run on Lasix, which they're going to run on Lasix today. I'm not a big like Lasix person, but sometimes it just goes to intent. Training extremely well, just in terms of steady works coming into this race. The connections have to be confident, has a live rider. And as far as the Australian form, it, it's more of a lateral move coming in here. He has the, the group or graded stakes form in Australia that makes him competitive at similar distances, similar level. Um, lightly race type that could still present some upside just the new face that i want in this field because i've, I've seen everybody else and uh, you, you mentioned the pace which you know patches ohulahan uh maybe uh obviously i have not seen the plot but you know looking at through the brist net and the pace ratings and the curing points etc doesn't look like there's a lot there. I mean, is there someone who kind of maybe could be a sneaky pace presence, so to speak, where normally they don't necessarily attend the pace, but the races they've run indicate an ability to at least be close well, in, that's a, kind of, in a sprint without it? Um, and based on the plot, it doesn't, it seems like he should have a clear lead. He's kind of clear in quad run one above the par line, but is still a circle. Chasing him would be um, Last American Exit, the four, six, Secret Reserve, and um, and even Old Chestnut is kind of a shift. He's a standard. He's in kind of quadrant one, two square, but then on surface distance, he drops down to quadrant four, which is part of the other reason I was a little bit kind of lukewarm on him at a shorter price. Mm -hmm. um, but Flag of Honor, we don't you know, we don't know run style, like where he's going to be in the race. So I, I would imagine that with today's race shape, having some class on the side, could be forwardly placed. Um, and even with Patchel Hulahan having that slight pace advantage, this is still a tougher, tougher level and is a circle. So finishing ability um, is questionable, especially since he's been running it shorter. Super Watson was uh, the only other one on my radar is the top prime power uh, in Brisnet for those who look at that. But I was somewhat curious, uh, you know, class wise at Woodbine's interesting because you do get you have the restricted Ontario breads, you have the various sire races and stakes company, which is what Patches has been in. Super Watson uh, yet to try stakes, or at least hasn't in a while based on the page, but is winning open allowance type races. 
which uh, certainly aren't bad and worth a lot of money up there. I guess I worry that this horse isn't close to the pace too much from a number perspective, but has been close mid-pack. Uh, and from the outside, it would seem like Kimura has to, I would think, go a little. Um, might end up working out from that outside post. Yeah, I, I would imagine kind of the same thing. He's sitting in quadrant two, so it's not like he's a he's a deeper closer. But with the outside post and the pace scenario, I think they're they are going to be a little bit more aggressive. Or might just fall into that stocking trip by default. Um, class wise, he, I, I have all of his past performance. He's never this will be the first stakes try throughout his career. Well, he's been pretty much in allowance or optional claiming company uh, throughout his career. And this is a this is a step up, even though he's run well and, and run consistent speed figures, just in terms of optics figure range, which shows where what it takes to win in those prior races compared to what it's going to take to win today. And it's just much higher going back to, I mean, the, his most recent race, that July 22nd race is the closest. That one's a 87 and 95 optics figure range today in 89, 97. So mm -hmm. that 92 could still get in there, but it's it's still on the on the lower end. Lower 92 end. is what Optics has him, and he did run 95 um, at this distance on um, June 11th. But again, that's still kind of on the the middle part of that Optics figure range. All right. Well, my uh, conclusion from there is not an overwhelming endorsement, but uh, knowing that I don't love the three morning line favorites, I'm definitely going to use that that horse. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm really just kind of giving knocks is the fact that he's going to be priced because of those factors. And that's right. what he has to overcome where I can, I'm, I can make the exact same knocks on the horses that are shorter prices. So it's just math at that point. Well, some familiar names uh, in race eight, which is the open counterpart. I won't say male because uh, plenty, plenty of fillies uh, in this are entered in this one as well. It's the soaring free six and a half furlongs on the turf, like the first leg race six and uh, another situation, a nice competitive race. And, you know, as you said, in race six, we really won't know what it all means until we know who's in what race. But uh, another one where, you know, we're, we're gambling, but it's really hard to make a case for wanting to lean on anyone here at a short price. Yeah. Um, again, you know, I'll mention ready to jam if they do decide to run here. Um, I, I mean, you could al almost say that this is maybe a little bit softer of a race oh. just in terms of the kind of speed figures that have run, but you have lightly race types that that could certainly improve. Um, one of those that I just kind of would keep on the radar is the seven triple tray uh, making a third career start. The debut race um, was a little bit flow aided after breaking slow, but ran well in the Sanford was able to step up in that, in that spot and just from the visuals. Um, John Doyle does the notes out there. He thinks that this horse should handle turf. So is getting the opportunity to run on turf as a, a progressive type that they, they obviously made the trip to, to Saratoga for a reason. So they like this horse. So I would certainly give that one a look. And uh, Emma Jane Wilson gets back aboard, was aboard on debut. The other one is um, Please Advise is another horse that'll, that'll ship in. And uh, debut win was fine. He kind of got the right trip in order to win, but he didn't get the right trip at all in the Tyro. I don't know if that would have made the big difference. His stable mate won the race as the favorite gate to wire. There really wasn't much change in running order for those top three spots. And please advise, got off a, a step slow. He kind of moved up behind horses to get position and then had to check, got in a little bit tight, moved outside, took a bump from another horse in the race, and then just kind of stayed on one pace after that. I think there's a little bit more upside from those races. I just, I need to see more from him, but at a price and one that I think still has a move forward would keep on the radar. I just think maybe those connections will get wagering support as well. Now this one is a uh, similar connections to the one I asked you about in race six, Rosa uh, on the rails, Rhapsody three to one on the morning line. Actually, Bristnet wise, the same exact number as Rosa, but where that one was 10 to 1 on the line, and you're like, hey, is there some upside here? I look at this horse and see, okay, went out on the front end, pretty quick E1 pace rating for Bristnet, then drew off somewhat two lengths. I mean, one won comfortably in the end, but the number wasn't that great. That's a situation to me where I find horses sometimes get inflated numbers when they're able to run like that. 
Uh, granted, it was six furlongs on the turf, so a little different than five and a half on Tapita. But, uh, man, I'm, I'm surprised to see this one thought to be three to one. Is that just a connections play? It could be. And then, uh, yeah, maybe the running style and the open length win, you know, those those types of things. And, and people that missed on the, the win on the first time at eight to one, maybe start to jump, <laughs> jump steam. You know, we've seen that plenty of times uh, with horses. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the debut, the debut was good. I mean, you mentioned all those points and optics has it the same. It was a, it was a very fast pace early, took pace pressure, stayed on late. A couple of horses have run well since that July 1st race, uh, ready to jam being one of those that improved next out. Um, I believe there was another horse, um, another horse that finished fifth called Emirates, but was able to improve speed figure points pretty dramatically about a seven figure jump. Um, but yeah, in terms of a, in terms of your kind of main question, as far as value, um, probably just not going to be there for a horse that's capable, but could be just a little bit shorter with some others that have similar numbers. And, uh, I know Kevin certainly, uh, well stocked up there, well known at, at Woodbine. I, I don't know enough of his in- intricacies to know what this means, but I will know Rhapsody is two-year-old Philly not entered in the, uh, catch a glimpse. Granted, Kevin has several others, but interesting you points for here for the same money and, and does not cross center as Mark Cassie was wont to do. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've noticed this meet more than the other meets is a lot of these two-year-old races have been like almost a split 50-50 Colts and Phillies or Colts Geldings and Phillies. So I don't I don't know if that's just kind of like a, a trend this meet, but I've just seen it so much more. There was a race, a uh, maiden special weight race. I'm trying to remember when I did the notes for it, maybe last Sunday, that was kind of the same thing. And it was won by a Philly. Mm. Yeah. And there's, I don't, I mean, there's no bonus or anything, I guess a weight break, but it's only a couple pounds as two year olds. So. And in this case, I mean, well, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Not many pounds (laughs) to one, one to three pounds. Mm. Well, Well, maybe jockeys too. I mean, you, Split them up that way. You can get the rider you want or more likely to. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, it is King's Plate Day, and we have last year's winner in action in race number nine, the Dance Smartly. Speaking of Moira, who I would expect, even though uh, she's on a four-race losing streak, including two losses this year at odds on, uh, she's going to be the shortest price of the uh, of the whole sequence because certainly the King's Plate is not going to have a shorter price than her with 17 horses uh got flattered i guess fev rover certainly is, has come back to run well in her next two uh and if they were to run this if she were in here now off what she's done maybe moira wouldn't even be favored but does she finally catch a group she can beat or uh is she just not certainly not who i thought she was i picked her in the breeders cup last year but uh they have to be disappointed to be over two as a four-year-old uh, yeah. And, and really, I mean, there, there really wasn't that much excuse in, in either of those races. I mean, you could say that as far as the, the return race, maybe off the layoff, but she ran number wise, she ran what she had been running in the past. So it wasn't really like an, an excuse or coming up short or anything like that. And then the, the Nassau stakes, there was weather that day as well, pretty heavy rains during the running of the race. She was off slow, had trouble at the start which has been a concern as of late. That's not something that she showed last year when she was really informed. She was getting out of the gate well and just hasn't really shown that um, that same pop out of the gate this year, which can always be a concern just in terms of form. And just was one one paced inside in the lane. Maybe it was the turf conditions um, that day. But again, it's like you're trying to make cases for horses at short prices when they're they're just not showing you that they're that they're maybe on the same class level. So she's certainly capable. I mean, yes, she's on that that four race losing streak, but I, I, I would make more excuses for the two races prior. I mean, she was disqualified from place um, when she made major contact with a rival going back to the EP Taylor. And yeah. the fact that that, and that effort was, was a massive effort from her and projected to, to regress in the Breeders' Cup. So I could see why you would pick her just in terms of like her as an individual, but going into that race, she just wasn't on the the 28 day turnaround. There just wasn't enough recovery time off that type of effort. So again, I make more excuse for those two races than the two most recent ones and at a short price. Um, she could certainly win. I would say if anything, it's not necessarily going to be 
herself to overcome. It could be the pace scenario because when looking at optics plot, there's it's another race where there's not a lot of pace. And <laughs> one of those horses that has pace has class in number nine, Miss Dracarys, um, who's going to pick this spot, which is kind of an ambitious spot to make a first re- return of the season off that 273 day layoff. Castellano is aboard the ride, training pretty consistently. They pick the spot. And you noted this earlier, this turf race being um, a mile and a 16th, but it's one turn. And Mr. Carries has run really well on one turn in her races. And I think they they kind of pick this spot for the distance and the fact that it is a one turn race. So I think she's pretty live in here. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't see a trainer change, but odd that Neil Drysdale's only run this horse in New York. It, was she really with Drysdale last year? I would I would imagine he's run a few that have done that pattern. Hmm. Well, yeah. well, like you said, the one turn at, and at Belmont that you know the mile especially is is a turn on the turf and less. So yeah, that that pairs up well. Last question uh, back to Moira real quick. Uh, Hernandez back aboard. Any thought that he just might fit her better. Um, it, it does seem like the Nassau and the, uh, don't know the name of the, the stakes before that, which was on Tapita, but they, they actually ended up being a little closer. Bristnet has both paces is super slow. Um, so I, I actually appreciate that they put her into a, the race where it was already pretty pedestrian. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, obviously Raphael had some, some big wins uh, last year on her. Uh, could that improve chances? Are you a believer in jockeys fitting horses? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, jockeys, because they, they fit horses. It also signals intent. But for those reasons, it's probably going to be, is going to, you know, like Chris Larmy says, if it's in the past performances, it's in the price, right? In the price, so people yeah. are going to gravitate toward the, towards that as well, being like, oh, this will be the thing that, that turns her around. This is the reason to jump back on board today. And it very well could be. But again, it's not... It won't be any surprise, right? It's going to be in right. the number. And the horse who uh, did upset her uh, two back, super hoity toity, uh, draws the rail here. Eight to one on the line. I, I mean, maybe because there's enough horses in here. And I do think Moira is going to take more money than the five to two uh, morning line price. So, you know, they have to drift somewhere. And I'm, I'm with you on the nine. Um, part of the reason this game is hard for me anyway, psychologically, is. I'm really having to pry myself away from Moira, but everything I know about playing races and form cycle is she's just not a bet at the price she's going to be. Uh, so I landed on the outside as well, but I was, you know, eight to one, super hoity toity, you know, knowing that she can kind of get out there and hold a horse like Moira at bay, uh, somewhat intriguing to me. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't really, she was kind of a tougher read for me. I wouldn't talk anybody off her. She was, she was all out to hold out Moira in that race, um, which we're only showing the abbreviation as well. So we'll just call it the June 3rd race. <laughs> that race. Um, but she had just, you know, she had just enough. Those top two were together at the wire. So both earning B optics grades, they're, they're tough to split. Um, Super Hoi Twaby was, was able to control the pace that day, but this is completely different because it's the rail draw. It's one turn. It's on the turf. I don't know where that speed comes into play. And if she does, I don't know if she's necessarily going to be as quick in order to hold late. She was all out to hold late in that race. Uh, she did win a one turn turf race last year. She came from off the pace in the Ontario Colleen and she was very classy that day. She, she ran probably visually one of the better races, even though it's not necessarily the faster race that day, but did come from off the pace. So it's, you know, it's tough to know where they're going to, where they're going to try to ride from today. If she is on the lead, I would like her a little bit less, but I don't know what kind of trip she's going to get from off the pace and the rail, just kind of a tougher, tougher read. Now, one of the other horses that did run in that Ontario Colleen last year is uh, Ready Lady, and she could sneak away at a bit of a price in here. Her effort in Ontario Colleen, it wasn't on the level of um, super hoity-toity, but it was a better competitive race than that fifth place finish looks on paper. And then since that race, um, kind of finding herself back around, again, they thought something of her to at least run in an Atalma in her second start after breaking her maiden on debut. Maybe is not quite good enough to to win this race, but it should be a big price that I wouldn't be surprised if she's she's in the mix. All right, and uh, I feel we have to mention number seven, uh, Salima Salima, 
uh, three to one on the line. Chad Brown, obviously going to get respect. Uh, one of the top local jocks takes them out too. I know some are dismissive of, of turf speed ratings and using them. Uh, and maybe I can understand, you know, getting to a granular does how much will a point make a difference on turf looking at Brisnet. This Philly is not even in the ballpark of several of these. Um, so to me, it, it's a toss knowing that Chad Brown's going to attract money with whoever he brings. And uh, especially coming off a, a win at Saratoga, people are going to see that too. Um, I mean, I have no use for this horse. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. And she's maybe one of the ones that wants to be forwardly placed in this race, maybe has to take that role by default. Um, but kind of like super hoity-toity, I just don't know if she has like the speed in the class for this type of configuration and level in order to hold. Um, El Malachio maybe is going to be kind of up in that mix as well. They got to try to put her in the race to, to give her her best chance to compete. Um, yeah, but I, I'm I'm with you. It wasn't one that, especially at a short price, that I had much interest in. All right. Well, uh, no favorite so far. And I will say that uh, at least on the morning line is going to continue for me uh, in the big one, the Kings plate, 17 horses, 19 entered. So hopefully we'll, we'll get that 17, which uh, fantastic for super high five players, mandatory payout uh, ends this pick five. Calix ships in as the favorite and uh, another situation, I would say a little dissimilar to the previous Brown we just mentioned Obviously, I'm not going to be shocked uh, if this horse wins, but at the shortest price in a 17 horse field, I, I'm I have to be against. Just for the for that alone, like not taking into the fact that the horse is fast, has class, has form, has the right running style. That's just uh, well. Um, I mean, it is a surface. So now I don't subscribe to the don't bet a horse as the favorite who's never done something before. So. I'm saying that cliche, even as that's something I very rarely subscribe to, but I do think that is a wrinkle. I mean, it's not for nothing, but that that's not why I'm against the horses three to one. I just think there's four other horses who are, it, we'll see if they're as good for sure. But to me, they're not that much worse to not take the price. Now, if these are situations I do feel, if you love the horse, well, you're going to get a great price with 17 horses. I mean, there's plenty of takeout reducers in here. So if you're on board, I get it. But, you know, for me, I just feel like this, the will pays going into the horses that aren't Calic are going to be a lot higher than they should, I think. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I I get that. I mean, if I'm, if I'm assessing, you know, the favorite as far as is this horse fast enough, does he have the right running style? Is he in form? Does he have the class? Like, that's a yes, like across the board. So I can't, you know, I maybe he just doesn't show up, which is kind of the scenario that you're playing for, which happens in horse racing. So I would never say that, you know, that could happen or the horse has a bad day. But every single race has been has been fine. And he's faced he's faced better horses. I mean, even the, the Belmont Derby, maybe not the strongest grade one or the strongest Bel one, Belmont Derby that we've ever seen, but some of the horses in that race were good. Web Slinger, Far Bridge, those are horses that have been consistently competitive at top level, grade to silver knot uh, in that race as well. You know, all really good horses and um, Kalik, not, not quite on the level of there, but Pace wise, wasn't going to get the right trip that day as well. And Chad Brown's brought in horses in here, so of of that, I I can't really I can't really knock this horse as an individual coming into this race, which is something that if I'm you know against a favorite, I think they're going to run out. Like those are the things that that I'm going to look for. But you know, I agree if you're playing you know if you're playing that multi race that uh, stake sequence, then yes, the payouts would be big. If you're playing the super high five, trying to get him out. Um, you know, good luck. <laughs> like, you know, you're that because that's what you're going to need. I mean, he because he he just fits. Well, and I I think with the seventeen horses, uh, I mean, it's just exponential compared to even a twelve horse field. I mean, the number of combinations is is gigantic. But to me, you you still, especially all the points you made. Like, okay, he's going to run his race. That's going to be good enough to be better than half the field for sure. 
I still think with all that added money, there you know maybe some opportunity. The four I prefer is higher prices, and this is a horse where you say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to win because my other issue here is I don't like any of the horse like fifteen or higher to one. I don't like any of them. Like none of them to me. I'm really stretching to make a case. So I don't feel like oh, if I use uh, Kalik. I can maybe hook them up with this 20 to one or 30 to one, which happened to me all the time. No, I don't actually hook them up because I'm wrong. But in the Kentucky Derby, you know, there's a tis the bomb that I'm excited about or, you know, some other 20 or 30 to one horse. That's not the case here for me. So that's why I'm, you know, more like, OK, I want to lean on these others on top while recognizing that Kayla could be underneath. But I think with the super high five, if you go eight to one, six to one, Kalik, you're still, you're still putting yourself in a good spot. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So w- one of those horses at kind of a big price. I, I will give a mention to, and and it's and it's a bit of a reach, um, but like you said, seventeen horses we can make we can make cases <laughs> for, for some reach is uh, number fourteen two way crossing. And just going back to to his debut last October, it was extremely impressive. That was a day that I think he did overcome the bias, one of those rare kind of X bias, where he was still green, had to close through traffic um, in order to get the win. And off that race, in two weeks, on a two-week turnaround, they went right into the coronation futurity. And he ran kind of sneaky well in there, despite the ninth place finish and what it looks like on paper. He was still a little bit green, had a big warm up, considering that two week turnaround of a big effort, had trouble traffic, the visuals projected to improve, which he actually did improve in the Gulfstream Park race and at Turf at, uh, at uh, Keeneland number wise, not quite on the level of those competition, but those are tough races. And then continue to kind of show some progression this year He's facing older horses in those um allowance races as optional claiming races and just kind of subtly stepping forward. He's still on the slower end than some of the other horses in here, but at least it's a horse that has some ability at times. If he is going to take a step forward, this might be the right spot. Um, he's probably going to get ignored in here because of the rider changes. This is going to be the maybe sixth rider and not as many starts, but it's a horse that at field he bred, he owns, he trains like, you know, he doesn't have any owners that he has to like compete with, that he's putting a rider on that's certainly capable um, to ride. And and just in terms of the works, it's kind of old school. I just kind of like finding things that I, I like or find interesting that out of the July 30th race, they work seven furlongs. And then when on August 16th, which we're recording this on the 18th, that's two days ago, the so four <laughs> days out from the race works a half mile. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that's just one of those things that are like, we've done too much. We're not going to necessarily run in this spot and maybe that'll draw in. But at the same time, there's enough that for a long shot in there, I'm hoping this horse gets in the mix. Yeah. Old school, like you said, for sure. Uh, to his inside, I was curious your thoughts on Paramount Prince. So one of several in here for Cassie. Uh, now I know, you know, if you look at um, the paper of where horses like to be, Uh, There's plenty of ones and twos and, you know, close to the pace among all these horses. Pace rating wise, uh, and granted, this one's only had the one route. um, So we're seeing some sprint dynamics on most of his PPs, uh, but very capable of, uh, you know, being on the front end. And I thought, you know, I I don't love the pedigree, which for a mile and a quarter, I know that's not your Ballywick necessarily, um, you know, the, just a lot of sprint in terms of what the, the sire is thrown. But if anyone is going to go gate to wire, it's going to be this one. And, and it's 10 to one and maybe even a little higher when all is said and done. Any chance this horse can steal it? I mean, yeah, that would be his his one way to win, right? Is that he kind of gets what he had last time, but he did have a much favorable trip that day. This is probably one of those times, too, where it is worth watching. So we've seen on some of the King's Plate days going back years and years where, like, inside and speed just carried. And so if you see that profile early on, this would be a horse that you certainly upgrade because he did have – it was it was a really strong effort in the, in the plate trial, but he had a lot of – he got that softer pace early on and that was able to allow him to kick late. So if there are some others in here that are going to keep the pressure up, you think the 16 would have to get out there from that post and given the complexion, try to keep things a little bit more honest and for the added ground 
Um, but yeah, that would be that would be the scenario that he he wins this race. The only way he'd win, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, absolutely. Uh, the stable mate uh, off the pace type taking the the Moira path, although she didn't win the Woodbine Oaks by ten. Uh, she did win by by more than two though. Elijah and Field uh, also trained by Cassie, but uh, to me, like from a most likely winner standpoint, I guess, or at least most likely to upset. Kalik uh, and be worth the price. Uh, she was my pick. Yeah, she um, she's got kind of the same pattern as the stablemate Paramount Paramount Prince. Am I saying that right? Um, so I have to, there's so many horses. I've got to scroll pages <laughs> in order to remember who's who. Um, that same pattern where shown shown progression number wise, race to race, and then ran their best effort um, in the Woodbine Oaks, but. Unlike it was kind of an opposite tale of opposite trips where Paramount Prince was able to get the race flow soft in order to close late. Elijah Fields was able to get a fast, very fast pace and still close late. Now they still were going very fast late, but I think the race shape did help. And, and then the barn kind of sending out live and her sitting on that, that peak effort. She's going to run back in 28 days, which is only something she's done one other time typically has a little bit more time between starts. The only other time was, um, that race back on February 5th, but tough to take much out of that as it wasn't, you know, an off the turf to turn to Peter race uh, with a wide trip at Gulfstream park. Number 11 touch and ride uh, maiden last out. This will only be 19 days for him. The number came back quick. Uh, and it, it looks like a pretty good effort. First time, two turns, first time to PETA. Uh, you know, distance looks certainly in its scope based on the, the pedigree, but Worry a little bit about too much too soon, but you know, curious if this is maybe one to tab that there is some real talent there. Or taking a big swing right out of the maiden ranks, third career start. Yeah, maybe they're maybe they're encouraged by like a, a mage type pattern, right? You have a lightly <laughs> race type that's just going to be peaking at the right time in the right place. It is a it is a quick turnaround, but the the debut was good. That debut race on the turf, I mean, that's tough to go, even if it's a one turn mile on the turf. And showed run was wide throughout, still made a made a middle move. The top four were together at the wire, so just keeping that in mind with a third place finish. And then Optics has it fast too. That's a 93 Optics figure, um, one of the highest, if not the highest, last out number in the group. And uh, did so yeah. did so professionally. I mean, he saved ground. He made a middle move, still closed late. So this horse can run. He can run. Both those races are good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm eager. Uh, there, and in this case, we're getting 12 to 1. I forget the name of the horse, uh, maybe before the pandemic even. But there was some um, horse who exploded on the scene that went made an allowance. So it was undefeated in two starts and was actually, I believe, the second choice in like a 15-horse uh, plate. And I just didn't understand taking that kind of a price on – a horse that it just made two career starts. So here I am, you know, looking at this one based on the number, but, you know, I think we're going to get at least a much higher price. And, you know, again, super I five purposes, you, you want some alternative in that, you know, fifth to 10th choice range to be in there. You don't want to just chalk out your ticket. So uh, yeah, touch and ride kind of caught my attention for that, that reason. Yeah. Anyone else? Um. Not really anything outside of like nothing crazier than what you could see on on paper. Yeah. Uh, well, I know you you're even more averse to it than I am, but you and I both share a, a top pick disdain. But you know, we all know that it's the name of the game sometimes. So I don't want to put that word in your mouth. But it, it did seem like Kalik for you is kind of the one to beat here. I think he's the horse to beat. Um, is he my is he my pick? I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna key around two way crossing. Sure. And Kalik will be one that I use, but um, that's that's gonna be kind of like my my key horse and just right. kind of hoping hoping for a miracle. But um, yeah, that would, yeah. And I I, no I'd encourage time. anyone looking at this race. I mean, obviously, if you have an opinion, you're like, man, I hope I get eight to one on whatever horse. And if you do, then sure, that that's a win bet. Never would encourage anyone to, to steer away from that if that's how you play but I mean there is just going to be so so much money in the pool on horses you know ne never say never we all see long shots win and crash the party but I mean there's going to be a lot of underlays at, in the 30 to 40 to 1 range here which you know if there's four of those that's 8 to 12 percent of the pool right 
with that completely dead money. So, uh, you know, to me, yeah, I, I'm with you. It's like, yeah, we, we like, you know, for me, Elijah and Fields, but, you know, maybe touch and ride could be fourth um, and help the super high five or in your case, two way crossing, which uh, I get. So, you know, let's hope. Yeah. Take a stab. <laughs> any, uh, any parting thoughts on Woodbine? Uh, no, I, I wrote up, um, I wrote quite a few races and did some of the non-stakes races as well, because there's, there's opportunities. I mean, Is that the, number, the numbers the same in the maiden claiming up race to start out or you know, state red race to start out than the finale. So I wrote up a few. It's a good day of racing. Um, I, I won't be there, but I will be there for the Woodbine Mile. Oh, me too. Really? Yeah. Wow. And you know who else? Uh, no. Bean. Really? Wow. Team, team 1980. Wow. Nice. Yeah. We'll have to recreate the dinner joke. <laughs> or the uh, Elvira um, <laughs> picture. Siskel and Ebert. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, yeah I'm excited about the, uh, the Woodbine Mile. It do a good job as they do here. Are, are those write-ups you mentioned on the Woodbine site? Yes. Okay, yeah. well, we will link that below so uh, you can catch up on the uh, eight other races on the card. Uh, well, you didn't do them all, but uh, selected close. among the eight other close. races. Yeah. Uh, so, again, pick five, all stakes, starts race six, mandatory payout, super high five. That'll probably be a seven-figure pool, I'm sure. Uh, King's Plate is race 10. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Ed. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>